Hello and good afternoon. My name is Amelia Park and I am the archive for uh, Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services in New York. As the archive specialist for GIPSME, um, I teach workshops and webinars on a range of topics such as archival processing, identifying preservation needs, emergency preparedness, and institutional policy. I also conduct most of the archival needs assessments, so if you apply for one of those grants, I am probably the one who's going to show up. Okay, so we have a few official things to go over first. A little bit about our program. The Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York program, or DIPSME as we lovingly refer to it, is a five-year initiative to deliver essential training and services to New York's collecting institutions. DIPSME services include archival needs assessments, preservation and conservation surveys, guidance with strategic planning, and access to a variety of educational programs and workshops. DIPSME makes these services available free of charge to New York-based organizations that collect, preserve, and make accessible historical records and or library research materials. You can learn more about DIPSME and our services at our website, dipsme.org. I am near my new microphone. I do see these complaints. Um, let me see adjust it a little. Hmm. Okay, does this help? No. <laughs> um, hold on just a second. All right, is this any better? <laughs> All right. Now, oh, um, Marina still says no. Marina, were you able to hear the music earlier? Oh, you probably can't hear me. Okay, I still have a few more official things to go over, so um, I'll see if some of my excellent tech helpers can uh, work on this. Okay, so DIPSME is a collaboration between the two long-running New York programs, the New York State Archives Documentary Heritage Program and the New York State Library Conservation Preservation Program. It was established in 2016 by the New York State Education Department Office of Cultural Education to ensure consistent and comprehensive services to the vast network of organizations that safeguard New York's records and makes them accessible. The Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, or CCAHA, they are the administrators of the grant uh, contract. To be clear, uh, documentary heritage and conservation preservation programs are still funding projects outside of DIPSME, so you guys keep applying for those grants. All right, so in the past, DIPSME has presented workshops and webinars on emergency plans and recovery strategies. And remember, any of our old webinar topics on this are available on the website to view at any time, should you want a refresher. The goals of this webinar today are to cover the initial steps in emergency preparedness. The actual emergency plan is an essential document that every institution needs. However, if you don't plan have a plan written, this can take um, a year or maybe even two, especially if you are working on that plan alone. So today what I'm doing is focusing on those interim steps to take as you are creating that plan. These steps will not only enable your institution to be somewhat prepared for an emergency, but it's also going to give you a firm start in developing a robust emergency preparedness plan. <coughs> we 
We are still working on adjusting the sound, but there are some things that are out of our control. So please bear with us and keep letting us know if you're having trouble hearing. We're going to continue working on it. I do see a lot of familiar names today, so I believe that some of you have taken our other emergency preparedness workshops and webinar, which is really great. Um, every time we talk on a topic related to emergency preparedness, we always try to stress that it is only one piece of the puzzle, and today is no different. Today we're talking about the steps to take before or while you are writing the emergency plan. So, looking at the emergency management cycle here, this would fit into that preparedness stage. Emergency planning is never really over and done with, when, um, even once you have your plan written out. I want you all to be able to leave today with some ideas on how to get started on emergency planning in your institution. Every disaster, even small or minor incidents, can inform how you can more appropriately mitigate, which will affect your preparedness, which will affect your response. So, welcome to the never-ending cycle of emergency management. We tend to use the words emergency and disaster interchangeably, and they really are not the same. An emergency would be an unanticipated event that requires immediate action. If emergencies aren't handled effectively and quickly, they can turn into a disaster. Therefore, I prefer to use the phrase emergency plan, as it implies that we still have some kind of control over the situation. Disaster is kind of a loaded word, um, and it implies some kind of major catastrophe, like an earthquake um, or a hurricane. Library, archive, and museum emergencies do have the propensity for being disasters but they don't have to. Emergency and disaster tends to get used interchangeably in our field because of this, but in fact, many of the things that we deal with are emergencies as defined here in the slide. If we prepare for emergencies and if our planning is successful, we will be able to prevent most disasters. An emergency, really no matter how small, is a training opportunity. It's a chance to check, test your plan, debrief on the event, and train your staff. It's an opportunity to learn and be prepared. Emergency preparedness is not simply having a plan or a manual, but rather it is a combination of written documents, training, raising awareness, conducting drills, rewriting or clarifying based on those drills, and ongoing training. You conduct this preparation process um, within your institution, within your parent institution, and in some instances within your community, such as with public libraries. Okay, so one of the first things that you would want to do as part of these initial steps towards uh, your emergency plan would be perform a risk assessment for your institution. Um, not only will this assessment assist you in writing the emergency plan um, that is specifically applicable to your institution, but it will also help you more efficiently prepare other aspects of emergency preparedness, such as planning recovery steps, putting together supply kits, and much more. Okay, so there are basically two different types of disasters, man-made and natural disasters, and either or both can happen to you. Natural disasters depend a lot on your region and your location. Fire can be both natural, um, such as lightning or wildfires, or it can be human-caused, so an electrical fire or maybe even vandalism. Mudslides, as well as flooding, can result from heavy rains, 
Um, but floodings can also be man-made, such as from um, from a dam breaking or something like that. Of course, there is the possibility of snowstorms and ice storms as well. Those of you in New York State should uh, be familiar with those. Okay, so man-made disasters are a bit more universal, and really everyone is susceptible to them. Man-made disasters are often the result of bringing in new threats, like construction in or around the building, landscaping or topography changes that can bring in new flows of water, perhaps. No matter how low your risk may be to natural disasters, we all run the very high risk from human-caused disasters. Vandalism can result in fire, uh, water, um, I don't know, really any of these on the list. So I think that the statistics are something like 80% uh, or more of emergencies and disasters affecting cultural organizations happen from construction that is going on in or even just near your institutions. Um, and this is when you really need to take extra precautions. The most common culprit is water damage. This can encourage mold growth if the moisture isn't taken care of. So water requires prompt and effective action, which you really do need to be prepared for. Okay, so what is a risk assessment? Um, it would be a really important preliminary step for you to take. Um, and this is where I recommend that everybody begins. So the risk assessment is the systematic process in which you examine issues. And this can be anything from hurricanes to a leaky roof. And once you have identified those risks, you come up with a game plan. And the ideal outcome of a risk assessment is to come up with methods to mitigate or make less severe the risks that you identify. And honestly, a lot of this is really common sense. The ideal outcome of a risk assessment is to figure out reasonable or affordable mitigation methods. Okay, so usually, I would ask for your input, but that can be a little bit difficult on webinars, but I do want to show just a couple of pictures um, of rooms in collection holding institutions and point out some of the risks that we see. So for example, um, here we have, uh, this works. we have some objects on the floor. Um, there are, there's no protective primary enclosure, especially for those two I don't know, vase sort of things that are on the floor in the back. And there is also a blocked hallway. So these are um, some of the risks that you would want to mitigate. And I do want to point out those framed objects on the right that probably has glass in them. So if there was flooding or another event that could shift the framed objects, then you have the potential of broken glass, which could, in theory, harm your employees. I'm sorry about the background noise. It's part of trying to fix the um, overall noise <laughs> that's coming through. Um, we'll try to minimize that. Okay, so this second picture here, um, what we are looking at are, again, objects on the floor. I have to say, this is a rather popular place to store objects. I think you are all familiar with the lack of space and the problems it causes. Um, again, the materials are in improper housing, so paper bags aren't great. Also, if you take a look up at the ceiling and the walls, there's watermarks and spalling. 
And this is really an indication of an ongoing water problem, probably um, a faulty roof. So if you see something like that in your institution, you um, really want to take care of that as soon as possible. And I also want to point out, um, uh, yeah, so this was actually the fire extinguisher, which is behind the door in the room. And there were several of those in this particular institution. You need to make sure that your fire extinguishers are up to date and um, not last checked in 1979. There is also um, this carpet down on the floor. And I don't know about this particular carpet, but I know for the institution um, here, there was another carpet that, that they considered to be part of their collection. So anything that would be a part of your collection in a room where you've got watermarks on the ceiling, you need to remove those objects from those areas. Otherwise, um, you do run the risk of having them be damaged. OK. So who should be involved in a risk assessment? Really, the more the merrier, to an extent. It is important to have input from all sides of your organization and all employees. The collection staff may have a very different view of what the biggest risks are to your organization um, than maybe, say, the education staff, for example. So all of the concerns need to be analyzed and either mitigated or planned for. Facilities and security staff are always important to involve in this process, as again, they offer a unique perspective that might be different from, say, the curators. It's also really great to get your local first responders involved at some point. They can often provide a different point of view on the situation and really get you thinking about those issues that you hadn't considered before. They can also let you know exactly what they plan on doing if there is a disaster at your site. And this is important to know because how they respond in a disaster could be a huge factor in your recovery. So some fire departments, um, they use like some pink chemical goo to spray and reduce the flames instead of water. So if you discuss this with your fire department, um, you may be able to talk them into using water uh, in your collections areas instead because that is going to be a lot less damaging and easier to clean up. I also had a site tell me once about how they had a tour with their local fire department. And the fire chief started telling them, well, you know, if you guys had a fire, uh, we would break down this wall here to get in. And the site's kind of like, whoa, 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 wait. If you're going to break down the walls of our historic house, you might as well just let the whole place burn because without walls, we don't have a museum. So instead, they came up with a solution. The fire department installed a Knox box on the outside of the house, which has keys to the historic home inside of it. And maybe this isn't how your own fire department would resolve the situation, but this is a good uh, example of why it's important to communicate with them. And one suggestion that I always make is doing an annual walkthrough with your fire department and just sort of hearing what kind of solutions they might have. OK, so risk assessment. Um, some disasters could happen anywhere, so these would be fires and flooding. But in order to really assess your unique situation, you need to look at the history of your building, as well as the history of your community and geographic area. Um, places like NOAA have really great uh, risk analysis for floodplains um, that can be very useful for you. Also think about, do you have hurricanes? Do you frequently get several feet of snow? Are you on a floodplain? All cultural institutions are at risk for minor emergencies. There may be regular leaks from pipes or rain. If you are in a historic building, it is more likely that this will happen. Um, I had a site tell me recently that because their collections were on the second floor, um, they were not at risk for damage from water. 
But the thing is, if you have pipes going through your wall or if you have a sprinkler system, then any of those could cause a problem at some point, and that makes your collections at risk, even if they're off the ground level or if they're not um, directly below the roof. So disasters of a more severe nature, such as earthquakes or hurricanes, those are going to require outside help and resources. So make sure that your preparedness plan would include contact information for emergency services and utilities, as well as services to help with safety, salvage, and cleanup. In any case, it's really important to keep track of past emergencies or disasters, no matter the size. Um, and this helps you figure out the areas of need. Risk assessments often aim to be very objective and data-driven. So what you want to do is keep an emergency event history log and record all relevant data so you can see reoccurring problems and trends and really be able to focus your time and energy in the most appropriate areas. Okay, so your emergency event history log should cover these bases. And it's a really good idea to have regular meetings on risk management, um, maybe once a month or once a year, really depending on your own needs. Um, and that's to discuss all of the incidents that have happened on your institution's property. If in-person meetings don't work, I've heard of some places that successfully organize online meetings where employees can just enter um, incident details into a shared document or database, and then there's a regular reminder or report summary that's sent out. And that seems to work really well if you're interested. Incidents could range from you know, just a burst pipe in a bathroom that happened to leak inside of collection storage space, or how many times staff or volunteers had to tell visitors not to touch the exhibit. And yes, that is something that you need to keep track of. If you have multiple departments or areas, like security, collections, facilities, um, maybe keep a running tally of how many times uh, your, each person sees this sort of stuff. Having data like this is always helpful, um, not only to hone in on the biggest problem areas, but also to make arguments for funding and grants and board support. So if you have the times and the date and the durations, um, say every time the bathroom pipe leaked over the past year, you're going to have a stronger argument as to why, say, board members should contribute to help replace the pipe. Um, so your emergency log can really be as simple as just you know, notes taken on a pad of paper, although you will probably want to make a habit of copying that down onto a more permanent format. It can be a Word document, spreadsheet, a database, whatever works for you. There are some good tools out there for uh, risk assessment. Um, I really love the Heritage Preservation's Risk Evaluation and Planning Program. It is now hosted on um, the AIC's website. And the purpose of this project was to demonstrate whether a risk evaluation by a team of preservation and emergency professionals um, supplemented by practical recommendations can lead to uh, preparedness at cultural institutions. And the site provides really great resources, such as a very comprehensive site questionnaire, a matrix that helps you prioritize and rank risks, and a walkthrough checklist for staff. These other two tools are also great, and they go beyond just collections and preservation risks to cover topics like programs and budgets as well. They both use step-by-step -step tools such as templates and even calculators. Um, personally, I find the UC Library Risk Management tool a little confusing, but a lot of people find it works for them, so I thought it, was use uh, it would still be useful to suggest. The Nonprofit Risk Management Center has many resources on their website. One thing that they have, which looks really great, um, is an app and that walks you through risk assessment for lots of different areas like fundraising, volunteers, governance, special events, technology, and a lot more. Um, the app is a little bit pricey, however, it does seem to be extremely detailed and comprehensive. However, um, 
that website also has a ton of other planning materials on their website and I think membership is only $29 for the year and that gets you access to most of those things. Okay, so once you've identified your risks and ranked or rated them, um, what do you do then? So ideally, you want to eliminate or reduce the risks as much as possible. And this may mean obtaining archival enclosures, purchasing more fire extinguishers, or lifting objects up off the floor. And remember, all collection materials should be four to six inches off of the floor. So what do you do for the risks that can't be eliminated or reduced? You prepare. And you may not have funds to fix that leaky roof, but you can prepare by keeping leak supplies handy. Um, you can't predict whether or not like a lightning strike is going to start a fire, but you can make sure that um, you have a fire suppression system in place. So once you've done your risk assessment, you can better predict the problems you may face. And I did want to show you some pictures of cheap preventive me uh, measures that have successfully prevented destruction in archives where it worked. Um, so for reoccurring problems, the plastic sheeting is, on top of shelves is a really great idea, and it's definitely low budget. So um, I've seen this actually in a lot of places. You can fold or roll plastic sheeting on top of shelves that maybe um, ha are underneath spots on the ceiling where leaks have happened in the past. One thing that I would suggest if you go the route of plastic sheeting is don't keep them draped over the um, shelves. What that can do is create a microclimate and if moisture gets trapped in there it can encourage mold growth. So until you know a storm is coming or you see a leak starting, keep that plastic sheeting on top of the shelves rather than draped over it. Um, although maybe if you're going to be gone for, you know, the holidays and your institution is closed for a week, draping it over the shelves in a problem area would be a good idea. So there's also this flood sock pictured in the middle. And I worked in an archive um, where every time a big storm would come up from the south, and this was in Texas, so we got a lot of really big storms, um, the water would flood underneath the ground level doors and then it would eventually find its way into the collection storage rooms. So what we did is we kind of permanently set up flood socks by all of those doors, and when we knew a storm was coming, we'd kind of kick them in place to cause, uh, make a dam, and that really did prevent the water from entering the building too far. Okay, the other one, picture I have here on the right are these movable wire shelves. And I've actually used these successfully in two locations. Um, and one location in particular, it was in a very old building, and our floors were these thick marble slabs that were set into I-beams. We had a walkthrough with our fire department. So again, this is where it's a really good idea. And the fire department told us that if there was a fire in our archival storage area, they wouldn't even enter the room to put out the fire because marble cracks under high heat and it would be dangerous for the fire fires. So what we did instead is we put our most valuable collections on these rolling wire carts and we have them near the exit. So that if in a fire, if we were able to have enough of a warning to pull out those racks or if first responders had the time to pull out those racks, they would be easily accessible. Okay, so most importantly, you need to have a written plan as to how to address these situations should they arise. Remember, you may not be able to control an incident, but you can be prepared um, and you can control the response to the incident. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about the prep. So as mentioned before, the emergency plan, it really does take a long time to create, and the prep is a great tool to have in the meantime. So honestly, most institutions that I visit do not have an emergency plan. 
I often suggest that an institution fills out this pocket response plan or the PrEP um, as they are developing the larger emergency plan. This does not replace an emergency preparedness plan, just to be clear. However, it really is a great short-term solution, and even once that plan is in place, it can be really helpful just to have so that your employees can have the most important information on hand. So the Council of State Archivists, or COSA, they develop the PrEP, and it's made to be easy to adapt and customizable for each institution and for each staff member. And it should include the most critical information needed to address any kind of emergency, so natural disasters, accidents, attacks, or medical emergencies. And you can go online and download um, an adaptable temp template off of the COSA website. Uh, COSA provides templates for government agencies, state archives, and records management, as well as a generic version that can be adapted to your own institution. So on one side is emergency communication, um, and that will have contact information. And then the other side is an emergency response checklist. It's kind of an organized list of the actions each individual should take uh, in the first 24 to 72 hours following a disaster. And I'll go over um, each side more in just a second. Um, but the idea behind this template was so that it could be easily accessible and this template actually has directions to fold it up um, like an accordion, and then it will be approximately the size of a credit card, so it could fit in your wallet or, as you see here, an ID badge. I also wanted to show this picture of the ID badge because um, this woman had gone and highlighted the actions and contacts that were most relevant to her, which I thought was a really great idea. Okay, so let's look at side A first. So the front side of the prep deals with communications, and this is a great guide for thinking about how people, and, um, for the people and groups that should be contacted in an emergency. So first, we have the institutional contacts section. And you can use this version just as a guide for thinking about people. I think what I have up here, this is the New York State Capital Region, region template. Um, if you're interested in, if you are located in the Capital Region, you can email me or look on the State Archives website and they have um, the template there. Um, so some of these things are going to be really specific that you see, but it's really just an example of how you could fill out the contact side. Um, but anyway, back to the institutional contacts. Delete any entries that don't apply or make sense to you, and then add those that do. Or you could combine it. So say your facilities and security person are really the same. You don't need two entries for them. Just combine it into one. Um, notice that multiple modes of contact are included for reaching key people. And the more responsibility the person has, the more important it is to contact them, so the more ways you need to reach them. Put the most specific number you can, don't use letters, and make sure that any extensions are very clearly labeled. Use full phone numbers, not just extensions. You might need to have a home email in addition to home phone numbers. If there's widespread power outages, it's possible that people will still have access to, say, Gmail um, or their home email, but they may not be able to reach the email hosted on the Institute server. Um, Text messaging can also be more reliable than phone calls, and there are some places who have actually done um, text training, which you might be interested in. You will also need a plan for after-hours emergencies. So who is at your um, institution after hours? Is it just a student at the front desk? If so, you need to think of a plan that works for the least experienced person on staff. There's also the disaster team section um, on the front side of the prep. And this needs to be four people at minimum. Six to eight is really better, but you may not have that many people on staff. 
If that's the case, you should really consider partnering up, uh, partnering up with a neighboring, neighboring institution. Think ahead about what your staff is capable of and what their needs are. Who else is available to be called in relief and mutual aid agreements and assistance from network members such as Alliance for Response, which we're going to talk about later, can be especially beneficial. So use staff trained in proper salvage techniques as team leaders for small groups working in air drying and pack out operations. Also, when thinking about supplies and equipment, think not only about um, the supplies that you need for pack out, but also creature comfort. So make sure everybody has enough water, that they have plenty of breaks, and also it's good to provide snacks. If this is a really big disaster, um, you may actually need to think about bringing in porta potties. Okay, is audio back on? Okay, that's good. Oh boy. I have to say, you're really at a loss for this. Okay, um, so utilities may be internal or external or both. Uh, regardless, let contractors know that they're on the list. Make sure to include the 24-hour numbers for your gas, water, and electric companies. You might need to make one version of the prep for senior staff and one for the rest. So for example, you may not want your interns calling the elevator company. Um, instead, they should have a plan saying, um, call it their supervisor. So next step would be regional contacts and other. Oh, sorry, we already went over building utilities. So regional contacts, um, which you could interpret in a number of ways. I have here a screenshot of the New York State Capital District template. Um, so you can actually see how they've chosen to fill in this regional contact section. You could list places like your state representatives, um, like a state archivist, or any other agencies that may help you out in a disaster. Or maybe just other institutions that are close by that may be able to assist. As always, make sure they know what they're, what, um, Oh, make sure that they know they're going on your list as a contact because you do not want to surprise them in the middle of the night with a phone call saying, hey, um, can you come and help us out? Also note that these phone numbers are not going to be 24 hours, especially for state agencies, so you may want a contingency plan. For the first responders section, make sure that you know how your phone works. Can you just dial 911 or do you need to dial 9 first? If that's the case, write it out as you would dial it and specify if that's from work or, you know, your cell phone. Also, some institutions you're actually supposed to call facilities or security first, so figure that all out before the emergency. Um, also, when you're calling 911, make sure that you know the difference between calling from a cell, cell phone versus a landline. They do show up different on the 911 operating system, and it may be difficult for them to find your precise location. So, um, if that's the case, make sure that you're prepared to give directions to your location. The Emergency Recovery Services section provides recommendations for the types of service providers that are commonly needed after an emergency. Um, you should find the appropriate vendors for your area and again, discuss with, with them ahead of time what you might need in an emergency. Okay, last we have the staff phone tree. It's critically important to have an up-to-date phone list of staff, volunteers, interns, student employees for making immediate contact in the event of an emergency. If you have a large staff and the whole list won't fit here, list HR contacts or supervisors instead. Make sure that everybody understands how the phone tree works. It might even be a good idea to practice it. So what do they do if a person they're supposed to call doesn't answer? Um, also make sure that you 
Um, make sure that you have that phone tree list posted by the wall phones in your institution. One thing that you do not want to put on the prep is confidential information. Um, this would include pins or passwords, anything like that. Um, and I know we talked about emergency recovery services. I actually have you start with some resources. So we'll take a look at those. These are some of the vendors that I was talking about before. Um, and some important places to know about include the American Institute for Conservation, or AIC's website. They have a Find a Conservator feature on their um, website. You can search by disaster recovery services, by specialty, or by zip code. Once you find one, again, call them and make sure that you can add them to your list. There's also the National Heritage Responders, or the NHR team, which was formerly the AIC Collection Emergency Response Team. These guys, they come out later after an emergency um, for assessment and recovery, but they are not immediate response. So a great resource to have on hand, but they won't help you immediately. Also, uh, keep in mind uh, the Conservation Center, or CCAHA. DIPSNY is closely affiliated with them, but there are other conservation centers that may offer similar resources. What some conservation centers do is they send um, assistance for recovery. And again, this is not an immediate response, but we can help longer term. And fees for this are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Also make sure to check out our website, um, DIPSNY's website, and uh, CCAHA. There's a national resource guide for more suggestions of companies and organizations that might be located close to you. And this can be a great way to find things like freezers, for instance. You do want to locate freezers as part of your emergency plan because freezing objects does kind of give you a little bit of time to deal with the water problem. Um, there are national response companies out there, such as Belfour, that do like all kinds of recovery services. And it's really great to establish relationship with, relationships with companies like this ahead of time and find out what they will do, how they will do it, and how much it will cost. There are places like Pro or Stanley Steamer types of companies, and they're okay for um, you know, wall, board, and carpet sort of problems, but it's not, they're not really great for collection areas. They're not as careful about the um, types of chemicals or uh, the methods of water cleanup that they use. The mold testing lab here, M-Lab, is a big national company. You might want to find somebody more local, but um, M-Lab does have locations uh, located all over. Okay, let's take a look at side B. So this side deals with actions. And the template gives you a basic checklist for each of these categories. But again, feel free to make this your own. You can drop in floor plans, utility shutoffs. It's a really great tool, and it ensures that staff have the essential information needed within the first 24 hours with them at all times. Um, personally, I like to add a water response checklist, which you can see on this template. Again, this is the Capital District's template. Um, since most disasters do end up being a water disaster. So, um, you can see here the New York Capital District has some really great tips for water response. You might want to um, add that to your own. Um, and you're going to see me flipping between the Capital District template and the generic template to show you different ways to personalize sections. Um, staying here, this first column to the left deals with immediate response. This section isn't for contact information. Rather, it's a checklist of who should be called first. The actual contact information would be on side A. Um, try not to just list one name. Um, there are other suggestions in this template.
for people you can put on there. Um, you can even put the disaster team and then list the members on the Verso or attach the prep when, uh, if you post this by the phone. There's lots of options on how to deal with this. For the second column, um, we're looking at assessment and security steps. So security actions are listed as one of the very first priorities in this assessment section. Securing the building to prevent unauthorized entry and exit is really important. You need to secure both the building and the collections. You may need to prevent people from going back into the building. Uh, sometimes they want to retrieve personal items like car keys, but will not be able to. Talk about this with your staff ahead of time so they know and um, set a perimeter around the building or have staff manning each access point. The time you spend thinking about this assessment and those preliminary steps um, will determine how well the rest of the response and recovery goes. So plan early and your um, response efforts are really going to show the benefit of that. Collection salvage um, is lumped into this section of the general prep, but that might be something that you want to separate out or elaborate on. Um, something else I want to add are collection priorities. So you can see how the Capital District template has a whole column devoted to collection priorities. And we will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, So, okay, so I, yes, again, I would suggest giving collection priorities a space on your template. It's really useful. Okay, so if we look at, back to the generic, oops, let's go back to the generic version. Establishing communications is key, especially with the media. This generic version provides um, some tips on that. Um, you can't ignore the media. They will get the story from someone, and unless you want them seeking a story from really anyone at the scene, take control and accommodate them. Provide them with information. Um, we don't know yet. It's better than no comment, which kind of makes you seem guilty. And remember, there is nothing such as off the record, so don't use that as an opportunity to complain about how your emergency plan is 10 years old and your board members aren't supportive. Um, also keep the mem uh, media informed with regular updates. The media can be very useful to reach out to the community and it's a good way to find donations, supplies, or even volunteers. In addition to talking to the media, having regularly scheduled information meetings for staff is also important. Setting up some times throughout the day when everyone can come together um, is important because people want information. It actually helps to de-stress them. The general prep um, also contains information about connecting with FEMA and your state archivist. This may or may not be applicable to you. Um, so take a look and decide if this is something you need or if you would rather replace it with something like a floor plan. Uh, remember, customization is key, not just for each institution, but also for each employee. Okay, so again, here's the capital um, district template. And so if you look at um, the place where the contact information for FEMA was, they actually have the incident command system. Um, we're not talking about that today, but we have that information in another past webinar that we did. Um, and it is a really great resource to use when thinking about your own um, response team. The ICE, um, and we also have resources on our website about how to understand the incident I cannot stress enough how important it is to work together with your colleagues on putting together the prep. It is important not to be in a vacuum. If you are the lone archivist or curator, make friends with some of your neighbors and also check out the Alliance for Response webpage. This aims to link emergency response people and cultural institutions regionally 
and to help improve emergency response and preparedness initiatives. So see if there's already a network in your area, you might be able to become a part of it. Okay. Okay, so this here, um, well, okay, so I know I'm repeating myself, but ultimately you do need to come up with a written formal emergency plan for your institution. But um, look, at, thinking back on the prep, that pretty much takes care of a lot of the different sections in your emergency plan. This slide here is actually taken directly from a workshop that we did on emergency preparedness plans. And um, it focuses on the contact list. But if you take a look at the bullet points and the forms on the right, you can see that the prep covers a lot of that stuff. Okay, on to human safety. All of my talk in planning for emergencies presupposes that personal safety has been taken care of and that it is top priority. People first, then collections. And I know that the longer you work with your collections, the more they become your stuff, but you shouldn't do anything until safety is assured and the building is assessed and deemed safe. Okay, so at the University of Hawaii, there was actually a flood on the lower level of a building, and it covered where the bottom step was supposed to be. The step had broken off, but you couldn't see it, and one of the staff rushed downstairs, eager to save all the collections from the water, but they ended up um, breaking their ankle instead. So after that, he was unable to help salvage procedures anyway, and it would really have been better for everyone if he had just waited until first responders could have cleared the area. That's a really good example of why you need to wait until emergency responders give you the okay. And this is really the basic premise which guides all emergency response actions. Health and safety first. We all love our collections, but we have to remember this. Even at CCAHA, when we were testing our emergency plan, our director was getting us a series of scenarios that got increasingly difficult. And the first one was really the easiest. It was just, you see smoke in the building, what do you do? All of the conservators started discussing about um, getting collections out of the vault and securing them, but that's actually not the right answer. What you do is you get out. It's also important that even after initial evacuation, workers are protected during recovery and salvage phases. And this slide, show, uh, this slide shows very minimal protection, but um, it's pretty functional. So you've got gloves, got masks, goggles, they've got little flashlights on their head for light sources, there's walkie-talkies. Um, you should have these things in your emergency supply kit. And very importantly, if you notice, there are two people in this photo. It is really important to use the buddy system and let others know where you're going. Never enter a damaged building alone. People should always be in groups of at least two people. So evacuation is always the first action. When in doubt, get out. So I have to say, that most of the institutions I do site assessments for, most of them have emergency plans for people. More do, in fact, more people have plans for people rather than the collections. So good job for that. Um, if you don't have one, the basics should cover these things. Establish a meeting place in advance and make sure everyone knows about it. This place should be about 500 feet from the building also take into account who is doing um, who is doing what during the evacuation. So who is the person who needs to assist people with special needs, for example. Also make sure you have some kind of system for tracking people um, and make sure everyone is accounted for. All right. Um, Personal protective equipment, or PPE, is really just a fancy way of saying gear that protects you from health hazards. 
In a disaster setting, this can be chemicals and flood water, mold and wet materials, dust, asbestos, anything. Um, it's a good idea to have a PPE kit for each team member in advance. Remember that safety equipment may be hard to find in a large scale disaster. This happened in Manhattan right after Hurricane Sandy. You might actually want to have a cash supply for purchasing um, cash su uh, supplies because ATM systems can go down. Okay, um, sorry, back. All right, so masks and respirators are really important, and honestly, they are a bit complicated as well. So I would recommend consulting with an industrial hygienist or someone who is certified to help you with this. I am not an expert in this area, but I can give you a little bit of background to get started. Particulate masks are for dust and other particles, not gases or chemical vapors. These are available at Home Depot and other hardware stores. They come in three categories, N for not oil resistant, R for oil resistant, and P for oil proof. Also, there are three levels of efficiency, 95, 99, or 100% efficient at filtering particles down to three microns. For a nuisance dust and mold scenarios, an N95 mask would be fine. And that means it is not oil resistant and it is 95% efficient. Um, it costs as little as $2, so um, it might be beneficial to purchase a, a small stack of them. For cases that have soot or other oils, and soot does have oil in it, use a P100 mask. That is oil proof and 100% efficient, since it can contain carcinogens. These are as low as $8 each. And for the best fit, make sure that you choose the double strap models. Um, and any of these masks are okay to reuse up to a certain point. The clogged filter is actually, um, it actually works better than a brand new filter, but only to a certain point. So if they become really dirty, torn or damaged or difficult to breathe through, um, they should be replaced. Okay, gloves are definitely a good thing to have on hand. Nitrile all-purpose gloves are good for most wet or splash scenarios as long as you are not using solvent. Acetone will dissolve them. Disposable plastic aprons are also good for protecting clothing. Heavy polyethylene is durable, and some aprons even have pockets, which can be really useful. Um, as for gloves and aprons, make sure to take these off while on break or eating, since contaminants will easily transfer and could be ingested. Uh, you also might want to have goggles for splash and impact, depending on what's going on. And I couldn't resist this photo of the old asbestos clothing suit for hazardous work. Um, Please do not subject your employees to something like that. Another issue to consider when thinking about a personal protection would be lifting. Um, wet records actually gain 200% of their original weight. Textiles also get extremely heavy when wet. So make sure you're lifting property, pro properly. So squat and lift, lift with your legs, not your back. Keep that weight close to your body. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what should be in your emergency kit. Okay, one really common use for preservation assistance grants um, are putting together disaster supply kits. Until you have a disaster, it can be hard to estimate the types of supplies that you might need and how much of them to stock. There's a list of recommended supplies, which can be found on the CCAHA or DIPSNY website, and that would be a good place to get started. So how much should you have? 
Uh, shoot to have enough supplies to last for the first 24 hours of a large disaster until more supplies can be shipped or enough to fully take care of yourself in a small disaster. It's best to have designated disaster supplies, but some things not designated will have to be used in non-disaster times as well. So that could include a wet dry vac, um, fans, large tables. These clearly can't be reserved only for disasters, but make sure you know where they're located. Some things may need to be supplied by a vendor under contract with your institution, like uh, porta potties or a generator. There are ready-made disaster supply kits, such as the React Pack, pictured above. Um, these are great for smaller institutions um, or just something to get you started quickly. And they include the basics, such as a mop, a bucket, plastic sheeting, some personal protective gear, caution tape, flashlight, clipboard. These usually cost, I think, about uh, $260. It looks like I made, no, I did update the prices of the title. Um, most places are going to need more than one of these. If you have the time and ability, you can also put together your own kits for, usually for less money. So we'll take a look at some of those. Okay, so these pictures are of disaster supplies from the University of California at San Diego. And the can on the right was put together by the museum, I think for about $150, but that was several years ago. So I don't know, with inflation, that's probably about 200. Um, it's on wheels, which is really nice. That means that you can bring it to the disaster. Um, one thing that I always suggest is personalizing your kit for the risk assessment that I'm sure you all conducted. Um, one thing that I always suggest adding is flood box or other super absorbent material because again, most emergencies um, end up having a water component to them. These kits are a really great, reliable source of immediate response with supplies, but it's really important that everyone in the institution understands the supplies are only to be used in a disaster. And this can be tricky. One thing I swear always disappears from the emergency kits are scissors. Um, but, and people think, I'm just going to borrow this for a little bit and then I'll put it back, but it, well, it gets forgotten and then it never gets back there. In these examples, um, I think they zip tied the kits shut, so it required a bit of effort to break into, um, and it helped mitigate the borrowing of supplies, but that does have its drawbacks. Supplies are actually quite thick and they can be hard to break into. In an emergency, it may not be easy to find, well, those scissors that always go missing. Um, and I think at another participant at a workshop um, I taught suggested wrapping the kits in saran wrap, which I thought was an excellent idea. Um, still inhibits getting into the kits, but it's easier to break that seal. Um, even so, it is inevitable something will be borrowed, and because of this, it is important that your kits are inventoried at least once a year. You should also take that opportunity to check the batteries. Okay, let's talk a little bit about collection priorities because sometimes, if you're lucky, you or emergency responders have time to save items in your collection. But in order to ensure the most important things are saved, you need to create your priority list. So long before an emergency or disaster happens, you do need to have an inventory of the items in your collection as well as a list of the items or collections that have the greatest value to your institution. You can choose these by looking at um, the things listed in the bullet points here. So essential records, these are the things that are needed to keep your institution running. Um, accession records, inventories, um, things that are needed for insurance purposes, as well as to track what you have and what you've lost. These are your top priority. Next come the collections that support your mission statement most closely and any items that you have on loan from other institutions. Also consider collections that are rare or of great value. Priorities can also be based on format. It is useful to understand format priorities for both salvage and for triage. 
If you have fragile items that are clearly already destroyed, you might as well skip those and work to salvage something that can actually be saved. On the other hand, if there are fragile materials that have very little initial damage, you would want to retrieve those quickly to prevent further damage. So as you can see, determining these priorities is a very complex issue, and the more you can do ahead of time, the smoother things will go in an actual emergency. I do want to call attention to this sign that's pictured on the right. This sign was used by the Theodore Payne Foundation, and um, Theodore Payne was a place, was another place that used those wire rolling racks uh, for their collection. Um, Theodore Payne is located in Southern California, and they were they are at a high risk for wildfire. Their archives are very small. The entire holdings could fit on, I think it was five uh, shelving units. So um, what they did is they organized each shelving unit by the priority of that collection item. So you see here number one, that was the first shelf to be that should be saved. Um, there are also contact information on the sign, as well as instructions for how to load up the archival material. Well, actually, last year, a wildfire crossed the property line, and they were given, I think, 30 minutes to evacuate because they have this really great plan and instructions in place. Employees were able to load their cars up with the archival material, and even though their building did not actually burn, um, I'm sure it was a blessing to them that they were not having to worry about the destruction of their archives. Um, other institutions use other methods. I heard a great idea of people putting reflective tape on the boxes that are highest priority for uh, salvage. That way, even if the power is out, you can shine a flashlight on them and see which boxes to pull first. So even if you don't have something like this, make sure you have a list or a map of your most valued collections with the emergency preparedness plan, um, as well as with your institutional records. OK, so here are some rating priorities. And it is useful to rate or rank um, priorities for both salvage and for triage. Um, I know this is a little bit generic, uh, but you can change it up to define whatever works best for you. Um, if possible, make sure that you have a list that includes uh, locations and even photographs can be helpful. All right, so as I'm wrapping up here, I do want to talk a little bit about the resources that are out there to help you with that emergency preparedness plan because you do want to gather a lot of good resources before you start writing. Um, I've mentioned uh, getting people from the emergency management community involved in your emergency planning. Um, it helps with risk assessment, with walkthroughs, this sort of thing. And that is really just the first step for maintaining a relationship with this group of people. And it's helpful to keep them engaged in your institution by inviting them to participate in things like training events as well. And often, as I mentioned before, they may be available to help, help you uh, facilitate the training. Many county emergency management agencies actually have staff positions for trainers, people whose job it is to help test and train emergency plans. They're often very happy to help you out with this. There are some things to keep in mind, though, when working with emergency managers. The first being that they are not going to come to you. You do need to do all of the legwork there. And it's not that they don't want to be helpful. It's just that they have a ton of other people and other agencies that also need help. If you are able to do your research ahead of time, understand them a little more, and come to them in an organized fashion, they're going to be very appreciative. And there's a link here that will lead you to a PDF on working with emergency responders that is very helpful. All right, so I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but there are not a lot of funding resources for disaster preparedness programs. Um, I do know that this is an important topic, so I wanted to touch on a few things. Um, 
It is possible to get disaster recovery funding from the state and or FEMA if you are in um, a large enough disaster, or that is if an official disaster declaration is made. So I always recommend documenting how much spending you're doing in any disaster recovery because you may be able to get reimbursed later. It varies from county and state though, so um, I would suggest contacting um, someone with expertise in that area. Okay, the most realistic option I want to point out here is working collaboratively with a regional alliance for response, and I'm going to talk more about this in detail in a minute. It can help to share the costs, and then there's also NEH's preservation assistance grants. Also, don't forget about DIPSME. We don't actually provide funding, um, but our needs assessments can increase your chances of getting grants because it shows that your institution is serious about planning strategies to prepare your institution for emergencies. Okay, so let's talk about Alliance for Response, or AFR. It began in 2003 as a project from Heritage Preservation, and the original initiative intended to launch a series of one-day forums designed to link key cultural heritage and emergency response representatives, um, hopefully to lead to uh, partnerships and local pro uh, projects. The aim of AFR was, and still is, to foster cooperation among cultural organizations influence local planning efforts, and enhance the protection of cultural and historic resources. So this may not seem apparent at first, but through an initiative such as this, resources such as money and supplies or infrastructure can be shared. So there's lots of projects out there that are excellent examples of what you can do. Um, in Atlanta, they established a local listserv that includes emergency responders. Uh, they share information and resources, they ask questions, they participate in first responder training through this list serve. Uh, Boston was awarded a hazard mitigation grant from FEMA and from NEMA to provide training at the community level. And this grant is actually, I don't think it's ever been awarded to an individual institution, but um, by banding together, it may be possible to get this grant. Galveston and Houston sponsored a disaster plan webinar and ICS training. Many institutions were able to chip in for the cost, and um, that, that way it was more affordable for everyone. Wally manages a disaster response hotline for cultural institutions in the Triangle area. Seattle has adapted a model of mutual aid agreement. Um, and all local institutions that join are expected to have a disaster plan. This way they can help each other. And that is actually still really active and developing. I think they just um, communally purchased a site to store a large amount of emergency supplies. Uh, Denver, they help to identify and alert cultural institutions in the path of wildfires. And Pittsburgh, actually I think all the AFRs in Pennsylvania have put together a disaster supply cache and their AFR members can access the supplies if needed in an emergency. So, although there may not be a lot of funding out there, there are ways to work together collaboratively to share some of that burden. Um, so start to think about if there are other small historic sites, societies, or museums in your area, um, or even in the county. Small institutions can really benefit from collaboration and resource sharing in many areas, including emergency preparedness. So consider, uh, consider forming a network with other local sites so you can build upon each other's strengths. It can start as a simple meeting, um, maybe over food or drink, and it has the potential to grow into a strong planning entity. And part of the reason that Disney travels all over New York State to present workshops is so you can meet peers in your area. Our workshops are excellent networking opportunities. So um, small institutions can assist each other by buying supplies. Uh, the obvious one we've talked about here are emergency response kits. Um, sometimes places only share the cost for bigger items, such as a wet-dry vacuum or a stock of like extras plastic sheeting, a generator, 
but you can also get together and share the cost for maybe um, archival storage supplies, such as document boxes um, and that kind of thing. You can also organize joint training sessions. Trainings led by experts are often very pricey, but if a bunch of you chip in, the cost goes way down. Um, you can plan disaster response exercises together. If one institution has an outdoor space available, um, maybe you can gather some unwanted books and organize a wet salvage exercise. You can also apply to grants together. Many funders like funding collaborative initiatives, and some grant opportunities are actually targeted for those. So making a compelling argument about how your collaboration in creating a support network and a community is really appealing. Grant funding can support the purchase of supplies, hiring a consultant, um, or hiring an educator for training. It can also send staff or volunteers to trainings that are located further away. All right, so the websites for CCAHA and Zipsini, um, they both have resource sections and they have a lot of really great information on there. The technical bulletins are really informative. You can find this information on both websites. And the last bullet point, I think I briefly mentioned this earlier and it really is very useful. So the purpose of the National Resource Guide for Disaster Preparedness is to assist institutions in the preparation of their own emergency telephone list and in the selection of emergency supplies and equipment to have on site. Um, institutions should have an up-to-date emergency phone list, and so this can help you find vendors in your area. I think it's a list of over 100 vendors and associations for reference um, across all I think regions in America. So that should be very useful. All right, and these are three uh, publications that I have found extremely useful um, in learning about emergency preparedness. And I would suggest um, you all purchase them if you have emergency plans to write. Okay, so and again, we are going to be sending, well, this. Uh, this webinar will be posted and it will be available um, later. So um, if you want to go back and get the information from that, it will be there. And then that pretty much wraps it up. So thank you for your patience with the audio problems. Um, again, this will be posted up again later. So hopefully that will be ironed out. And do you guys have any questions? All right, last call for questions. I'll hang out here a little while longer to see if any come up. But um, it was really great having you today. Enjoy the rest of your life. Oh, OK. So Tina has said, you mentioned joint training sessions. Does your office have someone who would be available to provide possibly training on wet document recovery? Um, I believe it was last year or maybe like a year and a half ago, we did have um, a salvage uh, workshop where we practice wet document recovery. And it is not on the schedule again for one of the workshops.
workshops this year. We are talking about bringing it back for the following year. Um, so you can either wait for that, or like I said, you can get together with some of the other institutions in your area and collaborate to get funding um, so that you can bring someone out to train you. But we simply do not have the staff um, to provide individual training. 